All right, hopefully somebody's said, yep, there we go. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate you guys out there. All right, sorry. So we are live, we'll do that bit again. I'm sure if you were a bunch of uh, lip readers, you would have gone there. <laughs> couple of hiccups here. So I am here with Mike from Starlight Express, not to be confused with Starlight Instruments. No. So Mike, give us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so uh, my name is Michael from Starlight Express. Um, we've been uh, designing and manufacturing uh, cameras for astronomy for sort of 30 years now. We started in 1989 and uh, we first cameras that we produced were uh, around about 1990. Uh, so I'm uh, the managing director and uh, one of the original three that started the company back uh, back in 1989. So um, give us a brief overview on the most popular camera. In fact, I actually have one right here. This is the SX694 uh, that uh, you do in both color and monochrome. Yeah, so the, uh, the Pro 94, 694 is the one you've got there. Um, this is our most popular camera. Um, it's a Sony-based uh, camera. So it's six megapixels uh, on a one-inch format sensor, uh, four and a half micron pixels. And um, the QE is up around 77%. Um, and the read noise is exceptionally low. We're getting only around about three electron read noise. Um, so for uh, one, of our, one of the CCD cameras, it's uh, incredibly low. Um, but the, the main key advantage of these um, is that uh, obviously you can bin the pixels if you're using longer focal length systems, um, but the thermal noise on this particular sensor um, and also the 814 and the 834 um, is incredibly low. We can take half an hour exposures without taking dark frames. It, the, the thermal noise is really that low. Now, um, jumping up a size, if the consumer wanted to have a bigger camera, what do you offer? I mean, because a lot of people have gone into this full frame thing all of a sudden. So we've got um, we've got a couple of options really. We've got the um, SX forty six, which is the oh, the one you've got there, and there you go. Um, so that one is uh, is actually a uh, an APS format. Uh, that's a sixteen megapixel five micron uh, pixel. Uh, which is actually a Kodak chip on that particular one, or what was Kodak is now on semi. Um, then the next step up from that is actually the full frame sensors, which is the um, SX35 and SX36, which are 11 and uh, 16 megapixels respectively. Um, so they, they are full frame sensors. And then we do a big brother to the SX46, which is the SX56. And that's uh, using the um, the KAF1680, uh, which is the 35 by 35 millimeter format sensor. Now, um, I've, I've used your cameras. In fact, I actually use the 694, which you know I absolutely love to death here, and it's, it's become my main camera. But one thing I've noticed here is, is the way that you guys have your system set up is modular. And it's actually quite a huge advantage over the other type of cameras that have everything built in. Do you want to go into a bit more depth about that? Yeah, so we, we've obviously always stayed away from um, going into a complete, completely combined um, camera filter with a lot of axis guider and auto guider, et cetera, um, like some of the other manufacturers. Um, the primary reason for that is, um, although having everything um, combined um, makes a very good camera. Um, we've actually found that uh, over the time that people like to upgrade their cameras. So rather than buying um, a filter wheel and then a camera, um, and then um, maybe a year or two later, you want to upgrade the camera to a bigger sensor or um, to a different, uh, different type of sensor, you then have to effectively throw the whole camera away or sell the whole camera um, and then buy the filter wheel, the camera and et cetera. So we've always gone with the modular approach that you can buy the camera. Um, and what a lot of people do is um, if you want to do tri-color imaging um, or narrowband imaging, then if you're just starting up, um, a lot of people do tend to buy just the camera to start with. Um, right. Then you can add the filter wheel once you get the hang of uh, doing some uh, CCD imaging. Um, and then obviously then you can look at auto guiding as well, um, either with or without the um, filter wheel. Um, 
whereas obviously by that way you're introducing yourself uh, to sort of um, staggering your investment in your hobby rather than having to go out and lay a lot of money down to buy a complete system um, and uh, and that way we've also got things like our active optics unit which again is modular it will work with any system any setup any different cameras but what actually one of the things i like about your filter wheel setups is um the off-axis guider is built in yeah and then coupled with the guide cameras that you guys have, I mean, it's almost like you have the industry standard in guide cameras when it comes down to it. The Ultra Star is what I'm referring to. Like I've, I've used umpteen different versions of different guide cameras uh, from different manufacturers. And I found that even though I have the Lodestar X2, the Ultra Star actually is the one to be using. Yeah, so the, the Lodestar X, or the Lodestar, the original one um, we designed gosh, uh, probably 12 years or so ago, 10, 12 years ago. Um, and when that came out, that was by far the best guide on the market. Um, about four or five years ago, we introduced, four years ago, we introduced the Lodestar X2, which had a higher QE um, sensor um, and lower read noise. So the actual sensitivity was about twice the um, sensitivity of the original Lodestar, hence X2. Um, and then about, uh, about, Two years ago, we introduced the Ultra Star. Now, the Ultra Star is very, very similar to the Load Star um, in that it's in the same body, which is only a one and a quarter inch in diameter. So it just drops straight into your eyepiece holder, which makes connection very easy. Um, it's also got a C mount to, uh, adapter on the front as well. Um, but the the main difference between the two, the QE is about the same for both of those. Um, but the main difference is the uh, the Ultra Star has about twice the active area of the Load Star. So um, certainly if you're using longer focal length systems, you get twice the, the field of view to find that Guide Star. Um, right. Not that many people struggle finding a Guide Star with the Load Star anyway, um, but uh, the Ultra Star does give you that little bit of an edge. I mean, the fact that you actually have the off-axis guider built in, I mean, biggest things that I think a lot of us have to fight here is um, back focus and backspacing distance, especially when you have like a flattener, uh, a reducer, and you're limited to like that 55 millimeter back focus. And it can be quite frustrating because I've seen other systems where the cameras that they've designed have already been pushed far forward as they can. They add the filter wheel. Now they add an off-axis guider. Uh, and then you've got to come up with some crazy other system. The beautiful thing about your setup is it's almost at that sweet spot. We're, we're only shy here and there. That's right. So we've actually designed our filter wheel, off-axis guider and cameras to be at that 55 millimeter sweet spot. Um, the problem you've got with some of the other cameras that they push the sensor much further forward to uh, try and reduce that back focus is that the sensor is very close to the main front window. Um, and in doing that, um, as the sensor calls, quite often you get a cold spot on the front window of the camera. Um, and that's where moisture normally forms on the outside of the camera. Um, and you're forever trying to use a hairdryer or something to dry, dry that off. Um, we, we have a, 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 a nice little bit of space in there. So we don't generally suffer from that problem. We also use few silica windows in the front of all our cameras. Um, apart from the SX56 and 46, we actually use Sapphire. Um, but the reason for that is um, few silica and Sapphire have much better heat quality um, uh, properties. So as the body of the camera warms up, the front window warms up um, and that stops dew forming on the front window um, of, the, of the main camera to stop that fogging process. We also have a, an argon filled sensor. Uh, the chamber is argon filled as well. Yeah, so I was going to lead up to that part, actually. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so one of the clever things about the camera here is uh, you actually have a, a tilt uh, mechanism almost where you can actually collimate the camera uh, and you can do this with the three, well, six screws on the front. I mean, a lot of cameras don't have that advantage. Do you go through the aggravation of making sure that these are ready to go ahead of time so the consumer doesn't have to mess with it. Yeah, so we have a laser collimator um, at the uh, factory that all the cameras go on to. Um, so we set the, uh, the front plate 
uh, so it's uh, it's parallel with the the actual sensor itself. So when it leaves the factory, we know that it's it's spot on. Um, if you have any issues, um, and you can by the time you've added um, flatteners, uh, filter wheels, adapters, off axis guiders, and everything else in front of you, you only need to be a few thou out on a few sides, you know, on those adapters, and you do end up with um, some collimation issues. Now, um, you can try and take that out with the telescope, but actually, um, sometimes it's easier to take it out with the camera itself. Um, so we have a push pull mechanism on the front of the camera. Um, and it's one of those things that um, we've been doing this for, uh, gosh, I think 2004, 2006, I think it was, we introduced that system. Um, and uh, finally, some of the, uh, the other camera manufacturers are just starting to twig onto the idea and think it's a good idea. And a few have started doing similar sort of things. Yeah, I know. I've noticed that. And even some focuses that you can get have that type of uh, collimation device. Um, big popular thing right now is fast imaging. We're talking like F3, F2 or some other ridiculous number. And the biggest important thing that I find is when you use these types of scopes like the Rasa or the Hyperstar, one of the biggest irritating factor is, is when you want to put like one of these really nice CCD cameras up there, they tend to be very big, bulky and square. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing about the design here is um, I think we're running a special on the 25C and the body looks just like this. And it's, it's not like you guys did it intentionally. It's almost accidental, but these things fit perfectly on these rasters and don't actually take away the obstruction. Um, Tell us a little bit more about the actual design and when, when you came up with all of this stuff. So we've always tried, um, we've, we've never gone for big bulky cameras. Um, we've always, always tried to make everything nice and compact um, and lightweight as well. Um, obviously, if you're putting one of these on your corrector, you don't want a heavy weight on it. <laughs> um, I have seen some correctors crack in the, in the past. Um, so uh, we've if you look at the actual design of the cooling system in our cameras, we have a, a series of holes that um, there's actually a, a fin in the front of the camera where the air is drawn through. Um, and there are a series of holes in the main body, um, which you can't really see. It's, they're fairly well disguised. They're, if, yeah, there's a, it, it's, it needs to be sort of pointed out to you, but there are. Um, but it makes, um, it increases the surface area of the heat sink uh, plate. So as we're drawing air through and expelling it out the back, um, we're able to get um, quite a big uh, delta uh, um, T across the um, cooling side of things. So we're getting about minus, minus 43 to minus 45 delta, um, and uh, which in a small little package like that is, is unheard of. Right. But also in doing that, we've managed to keep it smaller than the central obstruction of the, even of the C6 with the Hyperstar. Um, so uh, we're not taking any, any field of view. Um, so uh, if you put one of these cameras on a Hyperstar then, um, or a Rasa, then it works absolutely brilliantly. Yeah, I mean, I was actually really shocked how well that one works, especially that um, it's the SX25C, right? Yeah, the 25C works very well. It's quite a nice size chip. Yeah. So any questions from anybody, feel free to start sending them over. Um, we are running a little bit behind time because uh, next up will be Tim Russ. Uh, Mike's joining us all the way from England, my home country, I guess. <laughs> you know, as much as people can see the face, the voice doesn't match, as they say. So what new things do you have coming up on the horizons? I mean, I know you've just announced the filter wheel that you guys have. Is there anything else that you're allowed to uh, let um, loose? Yeah, we, we were hoping uh, for Neef to be a big launch pad. Um, we've also um, got a, a new spectrograph coming out very shortly, um, which is a fully automated spectrograph. So you're able to adjust the focus of the main camera you're allowed to move the camera along the, um, the actual spectrum. Um, you can turn the, um, you can turn the uh, reference lamp on and off as well, um, which is all built into it. And um, you can also rotate the slit uh, and control also the auto guider K2 
camera that's built in as well. Um, so it's exactly the same as our existing spectrograph, but completely automated. Um, and that will be out hopefully within the next uh, uh, six to eight weeks, I should think. Um, so that was that was something else we were going to uh, hopefully release at NEAF. So this is almost great timing. Bob Massey, who uh, I know who he is, and hello, Bob, how are you doing? Um, he's actually asking a question about the SX um, spectrograph is, will it include the USB control function? Yes, it will, the new one will. And just go into a little bit of depth about that, what was the major difference between that? Um, so uh, I, I attended the, um, the SAS exhibition in Ontario, California last year and um, talking to a lot of people there, their frustrations were that um, if you want to do spectroscopy remotely, um, it's actually impossible to do because uh, even with all the Sheliac systems um, and our own existing system, um, you need to physically be there to turn the slit right. and, and, and do various things. Um, so from there, we came back um, and uh, we started looking at how we could redesign it. So we now have um, all the controls are driven through one USB connector. Um, so you have basically a 12 volt uh, DC and uh, a mini USB connection uh, into the spectrograph and your guide camera, um, as I say, all your other functions are all controlled uh, from, that, uh, from that USB connection. And I think this is the important part. What kind of price point are we looking at? Um, so we're still waiting on final pricing. Um, so the current system, uh, just trying to remember the top of my head what it is, um, it's about 3,500 um, US dollars. Um, so this will be probably around about uh, seven to 800 dollars more expensive. Um, so it's actually is, perfectly uh, affordable. I mean, it's it's not out of reach for most people in in, no, in many I cases. Mean, we we get. Um, I mean, I go to a lot of exhibitions. Uh, <laughs> When there's no uh, when there's no virus around, um, and uh, speaking to a lot of people, they they tend to get into imaging, um, and they may well start imaging and 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 do it for several years, but um, they get to a point where they've they've imaged all the messier objects several times, they've imaged all the um, the nebula and planetary nebula and so forth, um, and it gets to a stage of what else can you do. Um, I've got all this kit, I've got this telescope, I've got cameras, etc. cetera. Um, and photometry is obviously one thing, um, but uh, spectroscopy is something that is a growing um, trend. And we're seeing more and more people looking to, to do some real science. And there are a lot of groups out there um, that actually take um, spectrums from amateur astronomers and actually use them in the professional world. Um, so the stuff that you do as an amateur can actually be be used within research at some of the universities. All right, Mike. Um, I think that's pretty much for our allotted time. Uh, I have to get ready for our next talk. I really do appreciate you being here. Uh, and this was very, very last minute because I was kind of nervous about talking about some of this stuff because I know the 694, but I didn't know the other stuff because um, okay. I just haven't had a chance to really sit down and start poking at some of this stuff. And of course, uh, being California, it's supposed to be blue skies and it's not. So oh, I have had blue really skies here at the moment. I know I heard you, you guys have had like better <laughs> weather than we have. So a um, couple of people are thanking you uh, on the live chat right now. So again, I'm sure they appreciate you spending your time uh, and taking your time out of your day to do this with us. So any last comments? No, I just uh, thank you very much for uh, for tuning in and listening. Um, if you have any questions, then speak to Simon. Um, he can get in touch with us, or you can contact us directly, and uh, be more than happy to help you. Excellent. All right, so stay tuned. Tim Russ will be up next. All right.